restart that? Good. All right. Uh, let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to get together and once again get to know you through the Holy Spirit and to learn about this great gift that you gave us, your body, blood, soul, and divinity through the Eucharist. Father God, we just ask the Holy Spirit be here with us tonight. Work through this group so that we can understand what you want us to understand, know what you want us to know, and that through this process, we come ever closer to loving you in a more deeper and intimate relationship than we have now. Father God, just bless us as we go through this process tonight. We thank you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right, well, we'll get started here anyway. To understand the Eucharist, this is the source and summit of our Catholic faith. If you don't get this, a lot of other stuff is not going to come together. This is the core of what we believe as Catholics. Come on in. How you doing? Good. Pull up a chair. Dan? You're coming in. You're going to check us out for next year, huh? Wonderful. This is Dan. Thanks for coming. Welcome, to Dan. Um, you don't have your Bible with you, do you? No, I don't have my Bible with you. <laughs> uh, we can grab one to share. Look, see? There we go. Ron comes to the rescue. Ron brings drinks. Ron, everything. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, as I said, this is the source and summit of our Catholic faith. We have to understand the Eucharist because everything else flows out of it. It is a sacrament. Um, so what we're going to do tonight is build the case for why we believe that when we go to communion, when we receive the Eucharist, we are receiving the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Come on in. See, I told you we should have waited. <laughs> Nobody wants to listen to me. Now, I'm always running late. That's all right. That's right. He said 630 to begin with. That's right, I did. Okay. Or would you like to see? Oh, oh okay. Ten minutes. Okay. Perfect. So now we have two people that were here that day. Yes. <laughs> Good. Okay. So a lot of people think that's kind of strange. We actually believe that that piece of bread and that wine is the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that it's really, truly his flesh and his blood. Why would we believe that? That's a little goofy, wouldn't you say, Dan? Yeah. Okay. Let's build it out. First of all, interesting thing, this doesn't prove anything, doesn't necessarily mean anything at this point, but we're just going to start around the peripheral and we'll work into the middle. Does anybody know what the word Bethlehem means? You know, that's where Christ was born, Bethlehem. Okay. Go ahead. House of bread. House of bread. Bethlehem means house of bread. Does that prove anything? No. But it's a nice, you can use it on trivia night. Okay? All right. So let's start working through. Now, for those of you that have your catechisms, we're not going to go into it tonight, but the catechism versus uh, uh, paragraphs 1322 through 1410 are where you find what the church teaches us about the Eucharist. We're not going to read those tonight for the sake of time. Let's just get into the Bible, but now you know where to find them. Okay? Let's go all the way back in your Bible to Genesis uh, chapter 14, verses 18 through 19. Call her out when you got it. Anybody? Genesis verse 14, 18 through 19. Go ahead, Pat. Oh. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God most high. He blessed Abram with these words. Blessed be Abram by God most high, the creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who delivered your foes into your hand. Okay. So we 
got this guy Melchizedek, who's a priest, most high, and how does he do worship? How does he how does he do worship? It's right there. You just read it. Bread and wine. Okay? What does that got to do with this? Just because some guy did it in the Old Testament, is that good enough? No. Start. Go to Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. Hebrews would be in the New Testament. Who's got it? I think it's Charlotte does. Thus though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Declared by God high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Okay, if we look at that verse in context, who are we talking about now? Who's Hebrews talking about? What's that talking about? Jesus. So now we're starting to hear the Bible tell us that Jesus is a priest in the order of Melchizedek, right? And Melchizedek, we learned in Genesis, was a priest who did what? Okay, I'm just going to go back to that. Again, doesn't prove anything yet, but we're starting to see a pattern here, okay? Hebrews chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. Says it again. Christ is a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. We're starting to see a trend. Everybody follow that? We got this guy in the Old Testament, Melchizedek. He's a priest, and he uses bread and wine for worship. And now we have Jesus is in that line. Does that prove that the bread that we take at communion is the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ? No. All we're doing is seeing a pattern here that this, is, this has got to be something important because it keeps coming up, right? There's got to be a, because there's a trend here, there's got to be something important going on, okay? So, moving forward. Uh, um, Psalm 110, let me just read it real quick. It just says, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Okay, same thing. Matter of fact, sometimes, you know, we've shown you a few videos with Father Mike Schmidt, the really upbeat young priest, right? You ever, ever notice when he's talking, he wears a ring on this finger, it looks like a wedding ring. Yep. And on the inside, it says, when he became a priest, he had it engraved in this ring, exactly this, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. He's got it printed on there. Because that's he understood his calling that once he became a priest, he will be a priest forever. Just again, trivia it doesn't mean anything with this, but I thought you'd like to know it. Yeah. Uh, Hebrews seven, chapter seven, verses one through three. I'll go. Okay. Abraham apportioned to him a tenth of everything. His name first means righteous king, and he was also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. Without father, mother, or ancestry, without beginning of days or end of life, thus made to resemble the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Okay. So, we're, again, we're just I, I just wanted to reinforce, and I've got, well, what do you got there? We're not going to cover all these, but there's like, I've got four or five other verses that all make this same thing. 
There's Melchizedek. There's Jesus. Jesus is a priest in the line of Melchizedek forever. Bread and wine is the core of how they worship. Okay? Just laying a foundation here. Okay? Haven't proved anything yet. Just laying a foundation. So let's move on. What does this mean? Why would bread and wine be a big deal? We're going to find out in a minute that we talk about the sacrifice of the Mass. We talk about that Christ sacrificed on the cross. He died for our sins so that we would have eternal life, right? He is the sacrifice, correct? Now, in the Old Testament... What did, they, what did they sacrifice in the Old Testament? A lamb. A perfect lamb. Animals, right? Animals. Right, and animals. Mm -hmm. Right. When they sacrificed the animal, there was always something. They always sacrificed the animal on an altar by a priest. Is this sounding a little familiar? But there was always something on that altar when they sacrificed the animal. Let's see what it was. Exodus, Old Testament again, Exodus chapter 25, verse 30. Samuel 25, 21 through 21, verse 4. Who's got it? Go ahead, read it out. You got it? Yeah, verse 21, verse 4. Pardon me, chapter 21, verse 4. A long day. talking 
worship again, we're talking sacrifice again. What I'm trying to say is that when they sacrificed an animal on the altar was always bread, bread of the presence, right? Showbread, they called it. It was there to simulate, or to not simulate, but to be part of that sacrifice, okay? Still, okay, that's, a, that's something nice to know, but how does that get us to where we, we think we're, we want to go with this? Well, let's start digging down. Let's go to Exodus 12. And we're just going to read from verses 1. Well, there's a lot there. Just read the whole thing. But we're going to go Exodus 12, verses 1 through 29. Whoever's got it. Exodus 12, you got it? Exodus 12, verses 1 through 29. Read it real loud so the mic can pick you up and we won't have to do this again. Okay. Uh, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month will stand at the head of your calendar. You will reckon it the first month of the year. Tell the whole community of Israel, on the tenth of this month, every family must procure itself, procure for itself a lamb. One a piece for each household. If a household is too small for a lamb, it along with its nearest neighbor will procure one. And a portion the lamb, the lamb's cost in proportion to the number of persons according to what each household consumes. Your lamb must be a year old male and without a blemish. You may take it from either the sheep or the goat. of its blood and apply it to the doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They will consume its meat and that same night eating it, it roasted in with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Ah, we're going to eat it roasted with unleavened, unleavened bread, bread and bitter herbs. Huh, there's that bread thing coming up again. What? Do not eat any of it raw or even boiled in water, but roast it with its head and shanks and inner, and inner organs. You must not keep any of it beyond the morning. Whatever is left over the morning must be burned up. This is how you are to eat it. With your loins, girt, sandals on your feet, and your staff in hand, you will eat it in a hurry. Stop. You're going to do what? Eat it what? In a hurry. Remember that, because when we get down the road here, that's going to be an important, <laughs> eat it in a hurry, right? So we've got bread, unleavened bread, we've got an animal sacrifice, and we have, we're going to eat it in a hurry. Remember that. Put it in the back of your brain, because we're going to, we're going to go work with that. Keep going, Bob. It is the Lord's Passover, for on the same night I will... Go through Egypt, striking down every firstborn in the land, human being and beast alike, and executing judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I, the Lord, but for you the blood will mark the houses where you are. Seeing the blood, I will pass over you. Thereby, when I strike the land of Egypt, no destructive blow will come upon you. This day will be a day of remembrance for you, which your future generations will celebrate with pilgrimage to the Lord. You will celebrate it as a statute forever. For seven days you must eat unleavened bread. From the very first day you will have your houses clear of all, clear of all leaven. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day to the seventh will be cut off from Israel. On the first day you will hold a sacred assembly, and likewise on the seventh. On those days no sort of work shall be done, except to prepare the food that everyone needs. Keep then the custom of the unleavened bread, since it was 
was on this day that I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. You must observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. From the evening of the 14th day of the first month until the evening of the 21st day of this month, you will eat unleavened bread. For seven days, no leaven may be found in your houses for anyone. Resident alien or a native who eats leavened food will be cut off from the community of Israel. You shall not, you shall eat nothing leavened wherever you dwell. You may eat only unleavened bread. Moses summoned all of the elders to Israel and said to them, Go and procure lambs for your families and slaughter the Passover victims. Then take a bunch of hyssop. blood that is in the basin. Apply some of this blood in to the lintel and the two doorposts. And none of you shall go outdoors until morning. For when the Lord goes by to strike down the Egyptian, seeing the blood on the lintel and the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over that door and not let your destroyer come in. You will keep this practice forever, a statute for yourselves and your descendants. Thus, when you have entered the land which the Lord will give you as he promised, you must observe this right. When your children ask you, what does this right of yours mean? You will reply, it is the Passover sacrifice for the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people knelt and bowed down, and the Israelites went and did exactly as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. Just one more. And so at midnight, the Lord struck down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of the Pharaoh sitting on his throne to the firstborn of the prisoner in the dungeon. in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was loud waiting, wailing throughout Egypt, for there was not a house without its bed. Okay, so let's unpack this. What did, what did we just read in Exodus? What, what it, was that a description of? It should say so right at the top of your, there's the paragraph. What is it? The Passover. And actually, what is the Passover called? It tells you right there. The Passover was called the feast. The Passover, the feast of the unleavened bread. Okay. Now the Passover was what? That was a sacrifice to atone for sin. Number one and number two, you took the blood of the lamb and you put it over your doorpost to prevent what from happening? Death. Or death. Death come into your house. True? Okay. So, it is for the atonement of our sin and to defeat death. Does that sound familiar to anybody here? Right? Why did Christ die on the cross? To defeat death and to forgive our sins. Holy cow. This is starting to get interesting. Isn't it? Now, let's break this down. What did we have to sacrifice? What had to be sacrificed? A lamb. A lamb. Not any lamb, but a perfect lamb. What was a name for Jesus besides Jesus? Lamb of God. Right? John the Baptist called him that when he baptized him. The Lamb of God. Is Jesus Christ the perfect lamb? Of course he is. Right? So now we have this sacrifice. We have Jesus, the Lamb, who's going to sacrifice himself <laughs> for us to defeat sin, 